How much has the U.S. changed over the past few years? A saying goes, a man is never the best judge of his own position. But the differences are obvious in the Chinese scholar's eyes. It's been almost six years since Xi Tao, dean of the School of International Relations and Diplomacy at Beijing Foreign Studies University, last visited the U.S. and 15 years since he obtained his Ph.D. in Chicago. How has the country changed politically? What attitudes do people hold towards China and the Chinese people? As China remains committed to promoting the healthy and stable development of bilateral ties, what efforts can be made to turn things around? I talked to Professor Xie Tao and I started by asking him what strikes him the most during his latest trip. This is my first visit in more than six years. The last time I was in the United States was uh, Donald Trump was running for the president. It was in September 2016. So after six years, what America is like? And that was really full a lot of questions, full a lot of uh, you know uncertainties because uh, you know. Will the America that I would see will this be the same as the one that I last saw back six years ago? And so uh, what the most striking thing I would say, it's more or less the same, at least on the surface. Uh, like the shops you go, uh, like the infrastructure, uh, like subway, the roads, uh, buildings and neighborhoods in Chicago, Atlanta, uh, Washington, D.C., and I also went to uh, New Haven, uh, where Yale University is located. And so I, my, my sense is that, at least on the surface, America remains largely the same as I last time saw it. So is that a good thing or, 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 or not so good? Because when you, if you, if you compare China with six years ago or other places, um, six years you've got to, there've got to be changes, but uh, it seems that uh, in, in the United States, thing, things have not changed, at, at least on the surface. Do you find that um, to be a good thing or um, not so good, if you know what I mean? You raised a very excellent point. That is, in China, six years could mean many, many dramatic changes within just six years. I'll tell you, I first went to the United States in September 2001, and two years later, I came back to Beijing to visit my parents. And then I remember I was at Beiwai, and so there's a neighborhood that was still uh, there when I left in 2001, September. Two years later, completely two high-rising buildings were already there. And so you can see the pace of change is so fast here in China. But in the United States, like you said, you know, we, after six years, at least to my eyes, things look more or less the same. I did not see any like you know particularly dramatic changes on the streets, the skyline, uh, people's uh, lifestyle, uh, road uh, traffic, and so in that sense, I would say America is developing. Uh, at least its pace of change is much slower than that one you see in China here. Let's talk a little bit of, about politics. I mean, that is your um, special uh, specialty. One of the things that I noticed is uh, uh, partisan dislike, meaning, you know, what does one party think about the other party? Of course, I'm talking about Democrats and Republicans. And according to some latest uh, survey, for instance, this one done by PU Center, Research Center last August saying this this partisan dislike is the highest um, in over a decade. Um, what was your observation? Um, you cannot see with our naked eye this polarization in people's mind, right? We can't. But I did have an anecdote to tell you. When I was in Atlanta, I went to, to interview a Chinese American Republican which is a, a rare species because most Asian Americans and Chinese Americans are Democrats. So a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, he sounded very reluctant to go with me. Whereas in the past couple of days, he had accompanied me to anywhere I went. So I asked him, why wouldn't you go with me? And he said, you know, because of the guy that you are going to interview is a Republican. And he said, I don't like talking to Republicans. 
So you can see this is a this is a true story. So you can see this this polarization is hitting at the very personal level. So people will never mention that you are Republican and you are Democrat. I would just not even want to see you, meet with you. That's terrible. So depending on which party you affiliate yourself with, people will decide how whether they want to see you, they want to right, talk right. With you. Like so, so if I right. say I'm a Democrat, and so maybe a Republican says I would not want to talk. And, with and them. it was it was not the case before. At least in my recollection, I had never had an experience like you know people telling me I do not want to talk to that person simply because of that person's right. party affiliation. Um, also, according to similar surveys, the share of the public holding unfavorable views of both major parties has grown mm -hmm. as well, and as high as at any point in more than two yeah. decades. Mm -hmm. um, did you get that impression that, you know, the general public like, I don't like Republicans, I don't like Democrats either? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the poll number you just decided, I think it's about 30% or 40% of Americans now say that they view the other party as a threat and they use words like you know they are a threat and i simply don't like them and so these uh, we in political science we call them affective polarization emotional polarization people get emotional over their politics of course in the past the people get emotional about their politics right but now people are getting even more emotional about their politics whether or not they belong to one party or not, whether or not they affiliate themselves with the part, particular party or the general public. Right, right. But most Americans now would identify with one of the two major parties, Democrats. What do you think? What do you think could possibly explain that? I mean, what happened over the past six years that uh, led to this? Uh, this is uh, there's a long list of uh, answers or factors that people often cite that contribute to this rising polarization. For example, economic inequality. When there's so much inequality, people get very emotional about those uh, who have too much money. And those who have uh, too much money, they get very emotional about those who have little money. They think that those uh, have, no, have not pose a threat to people who have money, right? And second is about this, uh, you know, the political parties in elites. They are going extreme in order to get their elections in the primary election. And third, you know, people mentioned about congressional redistricting, and then people mentioned about the rise of identity politics. And so there are a lot of factors that could potentially contribute to this rising, and I would say dangerous level of polarization mm -hmm. in America. Well, um, poll results also say over 80% of US adults express unfavorable opinion of China in 2022 the number is uh, higher than the past few years did mm. you feel um this kind of hostility this kind of um, um no yeah. no uh i i was concerned to be honest uh, lucian when i boarded on my flight because you know last time i was there was six years ago so how much has america changed and so you especially you have these uh reports of a number of uh, hate crimes of targeting Asian Americans during the height of the COVID pandemic, right? So I was concerned, uh, especially when, when I was walking on the streets in Chicago, in Atlanta, and mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. But somehow, uh, you know, bad things has never happened. But I do knew, but I do know that there are bad things that have happened to Chinese Americans or Asian Americans. And there are absolutely, you know, uh, confirm the numbers that show there's this uh, rising tendency of a uh, hate crime, uh, racial discrimination against the Asian Americans. I think that the survey actually means that a lot of people are negative about China as a country, maybe towards, you know, the official policies, not necessarily towards the Chinese people, Asian people. Um, do you have that feeling? That or you know maybe people are just being polite that they don't want to you know say it in front of you but these numbers um, they must come from somewhere. Right. When you do survey uh, uh, these days, you know, uh, these surveys often are conducted online. It's not face to face or telephone, right. and so people can tell their honest opinions about China or the Chinese government or the Chinese people, right? Uh, but when you are facing people in real life, you know, face to face, 
And people would not tell you that I am, I'm actually a racist. Oh, people would never tell you, right? Oh, and so you cannot know how people truly feel about having you in their presence. Uh, so in, in the word Duxian, I did not feel any conspicuous or explicitly racist or discriminatory language. Okay. How about, how about, how about, yeah, how about people being critical of China or of Chinese policies or of Chinese um, conduct in, in academic discussions or public discussions? Well, Did you I, know? Yeah, I got you. Um, uh, there, you know, there's a lot of story. Uh, I interviewed three uh, Americans, you know, who one of them used to be stationed in China. One of them used to be a, a high ranking official in the US government. And I also went to a couple of universities. I could clearly feel that they now had a very, very strong suspicion of the Chinese government. And they sounded very, very un unenthusiastic. When you were reading the local newspaper, watching the local TV or or radio or discussions in the media, uh, when they talk about China, what was the general impression you got? No, um, as far as I can remember, when I turned on the uh, television uh, before I went to bed, I I think most of the channels were running uh, NCAA, uh, NFL. And so there was very little coverage on China, except if you tune into Fox News or CNN, occasionally you would, would have stories about China. Uh, but in general, I didn't see quite a lot of coverage on the television. But of course, you know, television today accounts for just a, a very, very tiny portion of the information that the mm -hmm. average American got. But among the few pieces of uh, story that you watched, um, what was the tone? Because here in China, we had the impression that, you know, the media was all negative or overly negative when it comes to China. Did you have similar impression when you were there or it was uh, relatively OK information? I think it was relatively OK. Number one, my impression that there was very little coverage of China. That's the first impression I had. Number two, during uh, I was in the United States. It was the fight for the speakership by Kevin McCarthy. So there was a lot of, uh, this was like, you know, seven by 24 coverage of uh, Kevin McCarthy. And this, uh, this whole saga about his uh, uh, speakership. And so occasionally you would have a new story that Kevin McCarthy, he said he promised that he would visit Taiwan if he's uh, elected the new speaker of the house. Uh, so that's one thing that I remember. Other than that, I, I don't recall any like, you know, suspended, uh, but for example, two or three days of uh, continuing coverage of a particular issue on China. I don't recall that. Yeah. Um, what explains the, the growing consensus, however, among different parties? At least that's reported uh, in the news that we have been reading that there is growing, and, and our commentators have been saying there is growing consensus among different political parties, among the two major political parties in the United States to confront China. The latest news, for instance, the US, US House uh, China Committee held its first uh, hearing and uh, committee chair Republican Mike Gallagher called it a strategic competition between the world's two superpowers and said this is an existential struggle over what life will look like in the 21st century. Um, from what you're saying, it, it seems like it's business as usual, but on the other hand, you know, you hear this very un unfavorable views of China and, you know, such harsh words about China. So there are, there, there are two sides to the story that you just described. The one is the public opinion story. Public opinion as measured by polls that like Gallup and Pew, right? And so there you ask the Republicans and Democrats, you can see that they have a, you know, a very large overlap in terms of their uh, increasing uh, confrontational attitudes towards China. And then there's this elite level. You mentioned like congressional leaders both Republicans and Democrats, you can see like they're converging on getting tough on China. Like Michael Gallagher, the uh, chair mm -hmm. of the uh, China Committee, and they look at the Democrats, right? So indeed, there is. But you look at that, you, you, but you know, when you walk on the street and you talk to people, you do not feel that kind of a hostility, that kind of a confrontational attitude. So where does this leave us? I mean, 
because sometimes if you read the news a lot, uh, you don't hear the uh, average uh, gals and pals opinions on the media. Um, where does that leave, leave us in terms of uh, trying to reach out, trying to talk to the American people and make them understand more and more uh, balanced view about China? Because uh, U.S.-China ties is said to be at a, you know, the historical low, and there is a certain degree of anxiety or even worry that there may be some open confrontation between the two major countries. Yeah, after I uh, came back from the United States, I, I, I thought for a long time um, on my way on the flight, actually, what can I do for the bad relationship? And what could be done to make this relationship better, right? I think starting or resuming these people-to-people exchanges are so important. As I told you, I clearly felt that there was very little interest among American students and scholars, think tank people coming over to China. So the number one step is that we don't just continue to send Chinese students and Chinese scholars over to America. We must do something to get American students, American scholars, and analysts to come over to China and get these guys to see the real China. And these perceptions, distortions, uh, misinformation about China is, is spreading. And especially because after three years of uh, COVID-19, the two countries were you know, physically largely isolated from each other. So we ask, absolutely need to do something to get more people from America to come to China and more Chinese to go to America. Um, after your trip, having talked to these people, having observed what you observed, um, do you have certain degrees of hope that this relationship can still be salvaged, that things may still be able to stay on track despite the very harsh tit for tat that is going that has been going on in the media. I have hardly been a uh, pessimist in my whole life, with with a few rare occasions. So I would say, if you ask me, I would say in the long term, I'm still an optimist about the U.S.-China relationship. But in the short term, I'm not that optimistic because I can feel this is getting very cold. People are kind of uh, freezing out uh, in terms of their contact with China. And, and, and so maybe it will take at least five or 10 years, at least to, to get these people to people exchanges to get back to where it was before 2019. A lot of uh, food for thought, but thank you very much, Professor Shietao, for sharing with us your personal observations and your thoughts on this very important relationship. Professor Shietao, Dean of the School of International Relations and Diplomacy of Beijing Foreign Studies University. Thank you, Lucien, for having me here.